Um, I've had the privilege of, um, of spending a few months right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, learning about the theory of COVID and where COVID comes and, and how we should be managing COVID correctly, scientifically. Um, and then actual the actual application in the hospital setting. And when I became um, um, a partner for Possibility, a business leader partnered with the principal, um, Jessica saw the opportunity and asked me to come and speak on, on COVID-19 and learnings from the hospital setting that could be potentially applied to schools. So the title, which... Um, after I had come up with the title, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if this is going to attract anyone, but if I, um, if I was already managing COVID-19 in my school and someone came up with the title, how can we better manage COVID-19? Um, I'm not so sure I'd be impressed. <laughs> so, so as I was now having to work with this title that I'd come up with, um, I, I thought, ooh, I hope you guys are not, um, I, I hope you're not feeling like a cat who, who suddenly um, you get your back up because, you know, what is, what is this woman trying to say um, that we haven't been managing it well up till now, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to position that as well. So um, being brand new to Partners for Possibility and, um and, and now immersed in, in, um, in many of your challenges, listening to school principals and teachers at workshops and um, community of practice meetings, et cetera. Um, I hear some things which I, I find quite interesting um, and I don't understand because um, that is not in keeping with the science. So um, my world is the science, um, and the theory and then its application and my um, my expertise is enhancing that um, um, enhancing the um, processes once you put something in place and you try and make it more effective and and more efficient um, Jessica can you let I think there's two people in the room who are waiting to to join Okay, so, so please don't be like, uh, please don't be cats, please don't get your backs up. <laughs> and know that I come from a, um, a, not a place of judgment or um, a place of, of trying to tell you what you myself, there we go. Um, so yeah, it's it's not that it is a it's a space of okay. So this is what the science is. Um, this is what has been done in the hospital setting. Are there any lessons that um, that can be taken into the school setting? Okay. Uh, let me see. I find that when ah there we go. Okay, so. Um, quality improvement science, if it's um, something you haven't heard of before, it's um, maybe you've heard of lean, uh, lean methodology, Six Sigma, things like that. Um, quality improvement science is just the umbrella term for, for all of those different uh, methodologies. And a key component of improvement science, you've got to know what you're trying to accomplish. So you must have an aim. So you'll see my little target there. And an aim for anything, um, it has to be, um, we talk about a smart aim. So it has to be specific. Exactly what are you trying to achieve? And when it comes to COVID and COVID transmission, I'm not, and, and especially in schools where obviously transmission is happening in the community and in the school, we're obviously trying to prevent that, but what exactly are we trying to accomplish? In the hospital setting, it was to prevent, um, to prevent patient to patient transmission. I don't think we were specific enough. We were also just trying to fight fires, uh, especially in the beginning. So it has to be specific, it has to be measurable. So how do we know if we're actually achieving our aim? It has to be achievable, so it cannot be unrealistic. Um, the, uh, now I don't have my presenter notes on, so specific, measurable, achievable, 
realistic and it has to be time bound. So uh, by what period of time are you going to do this? Um, COVID might be with us or is probably going to be with us for a fair period of time. So, um, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I guess if you're trying to get a cluster outbreak under control, et cetera, then the time aspect comes in. So you've got to know what you're trying to accomplish. So if I, if you had to ask yourself now, what is it exactly that you're trying to accomplish? Now, um, AIMS have, there are, there are three very specific types of measures when it comes to an AIM. The first type of measure, I'm just seeing why my screen, oh, there we go. Um, and you measure to see if, you're, if the changes you're making are, are an improvement and, and if you're achieving your AIM, okay. So you get outcome measures and they tell us whether we're getting closer to our aim. And just off the top of my head um, in, in the yellow block, I started listing. So what exactly is it? What, what are we trying to accomplish? Is it no cluster outbreaks in schools? Is it no COVID in schools? <laughs> is it limited cluster outbreaks? Is it a well-managed cluster outbreak? Um, because I'll tell you why I'm confused is because every time there is one uh, um, suspected or confirmed case of COVID, it appears um, as if it's, you know, the, the world literally comes to a stop and everything is around that one case. Bearing in mind that we're in a pandemic and the primary purpose of schooling would, uh, I, I, is, is, is teaching and learning. So, I think these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves. So what exactly um, are we trying to accomplish? Are we getting closer to our aims? So the first thing is you have to set an aim. Then are we getting closer to our aim? Um, then you have proce process measures. There's a family of measures and the, the second are process measures. And so if there are desired changes that have to be in place, for example, your environmental controls, wearing of masks, um, um, uh, one meter physical distancing, uh, good ventilation, excellent screening, then is that in place every time, okay? And then the third measure is, I just wanna go back there. The third measure are balancing measures. Now, balancing measures are often the measures that get forgotten. So we're like, is everyone being compliant? Often, <laughs> where we are asking if compliance is there without knowing exactly what the outcome measure is and what you're trying to accomplish. And often you can so be busy chasing your tail because what you think you're trying to accomplish is, is not specific and it's not even being measured. So you don't even know if you're doing well enough. Balancing measures look for unintended consequences. Are we causing harm? By what we're trying to do, are we causing harm? And I, I hear in conversations and I, and I inquire and I hear about schools closed, schools being closed for two days. Um, uh, I hear about classrooms being fogged and, I, and I'll go into that, but I'm like, what? Why are you fogging classrooms? Um, yeah, so so many things that could have unintended consequences. I didn't even write it here, but something like fogging, which is is seen as wholly inappropriate for um, COVID or um, the virus, which is SARS-CoV-2. Um, COVID is the disease that manifests in a person. The the organism is SARS-CoV-2. Um, fogging is wholly inappropriate and can actually cause harm. Um, and uh, the inappropriate use of disinfectants will actually um, uh, make us more or less susceptible to antimicrobial therapy. So there also there's, there's other long-term implications that could have an implication on our health. But some of the, um, probably the more um, in your face balancing measures that I've been considering are, um, yeah, uh, critical teaching and learning deficits that are resulting from 
um, from the rotation system, from school closure every second week for two days. And given, um, given our social circumstances and that kids are, when their parents need to be at work, kids are home alone, potentially young kids. And I'm concerned um, been reading some studies on, on child abuse and, and the increased likelihood of that. So improvement science um, is a specific science of basically testing, um, testing ideas, but you can't just randomly test ideas. You've got to know what you're trying to accomplish. You have to be measuring to know where the changes are and improvement. And then you have a theory of change based on your knowledge of the system where you test, um, where you then come up with, um, where the team comes up with ideas that they think will be an improvement. Okay, so that's a little bit on improvement science. Um, I, I started research, not researching, I started looking up, um, looking for clips, looking for articles on school closure and, and just how big the problem is. I'm not entirely sure how big the problem is in the Western Cape and um, would love to get your input after just um, um, an, an introductory um, few slides. So um, I've included the YouTube clip here. This is a SABC news clip. And I don't even know if this is your reality. So this is in KZN, um, where um, there was a report, I think it says 11 schools had been closed. And what I found interesting was, um, was the issues that, that were of, um, that seemed to be contributing to the school closure or the outbreaks firstly. So um, one was uh, sick children still coming to school. There were concerns about screening and having adequate resources for screening. Um, and then there was, um, in the clip, there's a lot of talk about um, correct social distancing, masks and hand sanitizer. And what I also find quite interesting is that there is no emphasis on ventilation. And as the science of COVID, as we understand more and more, COVID, the CDC has acknowledged that COVID is airborne and, and very highly transmissible, um, but it is an airborne um, uh, virus. And um, although the guidelines and the SOPs um, that are published on the um, NICD website and the um, uh, DBE, et cetera, guidelines, they emphasize ventilation, but I just don't, I don't see it emphasized in any of the, when, when it's talked about by teachers unions or by principals or by teachers themselves. So an interesting clip for you to take a look at. Um, I was the acting deputy nursing manager um, at the hospital when, when, when we lost um, one, of our, one of our sisters who, this was before vaccines were available. Um, yeah, right at the beginning of the year, um, you know, where the rest of the world the rest of the world's healthcare workers had received vaccines except healthcare workers in Africa. And it was devastating. Um, my colleague, she had actually been one of my mentors when I was a novice critical care nurse. She had so many, she had so much experience, decades of experience, and she was an expert cath lab sister. So if you have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, um, Hazel would be in there basically controlling the whole setup so that the cardiologist can unblock um, one of the arteries in your heart and just the most amazing, amazing, amazing sister. So I, I you know, we've been at the point where all we had was the environmental controls that we could put in place and the other controls. But now we have the ultimate control, which is vaccination. 
Um, and I think our greatest challenge is, is making sure that our teachers and the learners' parents are educated and, uh, and vaccinated and that we, we deal with vaccine hesitancy in a supportive and educational manner. So this is, this is my greatest sadness that people already when a vaccine was available because of where we sit in the world that um, our healthcare workers didn't yet have access to it. And, um, and at the moment, I, I sit with the sadness of um, the people that now fill the ICUs are those that have not yet been vaccinated either, either because they, they didn't understand the importance of it or they've received um, information which has made them hesitant. So we've got lots and lots of work to do. Okay, um, before, um, this is what I'd like to share with you, but I'd like to just um, uh, go around the room and um, from your perspective, understand what it is that you're struggling with and what it is that you want clarity on. So I thought to cover five things, which is, um, learnings from a hospital setting around screening, which may be relevant um, in optimizing screening in, in, in the school setting. Um, a little bit of um, the science on mask, masks and ventilation and some, some knowledge deficits that I've picked up in my interactions. Um, just some lessons from the hospital setting in dealing with suspected or confirmed cases. I'm not going to go through the protocol, not going to do any of that. Um, the science on environmental cleaning for the coronaviruses for SARS-CoV-2. And, um, and I'm going to finish with reading learners for vaccination. But if I can, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And um, sure, see, we've got 23 participants now. Um, if you can unmute, and uh, if there's anyone that has a particular um, burning question or something that you desperately would like to have clarity on, and let's see if, um, if I can assist with that. And if I can't, if there's anyone in the room that can assist with that. Afternoon, Yolanda. Hi. Hi, Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for what you're sharing. Um, you know, you think I've heard everything about COVID and then you're still learning some more. Um, so I just wanted to find out about the fogging um, because you've just mentioned something that we all go to. Like we're making sure every Friday we're fogging our whole office, um, our after school area. Um, so I just wanted to find out about that. Um, what, what exactly seems to be the issue with that? Should we be doing it? Should we not be doing it? Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Nozipa, I'm definitely going to cover that. I'm going to go into a little bit around the guidelines and the expert advice. And also just um, if we've got a shared understanding on fogging, what I call fogging and what the guidelines call fogging and what you call fogging. So can I can mm. I just under, can you explain to me for a second what it is exactly that that happens on a Friday? Who so, comes in and does what? So we've got like the sanitizer surface spray um, thing that we've got. Um, so we purchased right at the beginning of COVID. And um, so we're cleaning daily. But then on the Friday, when the office is nice and clear and everyone's gone, um, our maintenance workers are going through and just spraying the whole office, the surface areas. Um, yeah, so just with okay. the sanitizer hand surface thing that we have. Okay, I am um, all right. I, I promise that by the end of this presentation, um, I think I, you're going to get the necessary clarity because I want to also go into cleaning, what cleaning means versus disinfection, what fogging okay. actually is, what is effective, what is not effective. Okay, okay so I think I, um, I will be able to definitely clear that up. Thanks, Nozipo. Okay. Thanks for the question. Thanks. 
Thanks, Yolanda. Um, I, I saw that there is, there's one chat question here. It says, our biggest challenge is dealing with parents' wide variety of opinions on the subject of COVID. Um, so I see if uh, I just struggle to read. So no matter what we do, someone is unhappy with our decisions here. <laughs> I remember <laughs> I remember um, being called to uh, the hospital. It's quite a big hospital, 230 bed hospital. And uh, being called on multiple occasions to, we had five screening points. So, and they run, um, well, two of them run 24 hours a day. The rest run uh, like 18 hours a day. And, um, and at those screening points, were patients and visitors and visitors to doctor's rooms who were adamant that um, we were taking, our screeners were taking the temperature incorrectly and we would, we would give them um, uh, brain cancer if we took the temperature correctly, <laughs> not on the wrist or on the hand, et cetera, like you see everyone taking the temperature, which it's like, oh my goodness. So yes, um, you know, uh, everyone has an opinion. Um, I think if you can back it up with, um, if if you've interpreted a protocol correctly, because there's nothing wrong with the, the protocols are pretty sound. I think some of the definitions and um, I looked at some of the drawings and some of the pictures that are utilized to, to depict certain things. And I think that's where some misunderstanding, you know, the the real um, knowledge about infection control comes from the hospital setting and very rapidly that knowledge had to had to be um, disseminated to prevent um, spread of infection in other settings and I think some of it got lost in translation so I, I am sorry that yeah a lot um, no matter what you do someone will still be unhappy and if you've previous, if you if you were previously doing something, and now you learn about uh, uh, new evidence uh, uh, comes to the fore, and you change what you're doing, you'll be questioned around that. So, <laughs> so yeah, and sometimes it feels like you can't win. Um, so I am sorry about that. Um, hopefully, uh, in the presentation as well, you find some some resources, etc., that are. Um, maybe more complete um, that explain the rationale uh, better and and maybe you can change a few minds but might won't be able to change everyone's mind are there any other questions i thought that's the only one i see from george in the chat and we've had nozipo's question around fogging anything else Yeah, I don't see anything else in the chat okay. box. Good. Cool. Okay. So let me continue then. Um, all right. Share that. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, yeah. So in, in the hospital setting, um, to hus healthcare workers, um, for decades have been accustomed to coming to work sick. Um, you had to be dying to miss work. And I have to wonder if we replaced healthcare workers with teachers and learners, <laughs> if, um, and we replaced the word work with school, if, if it wouldn't be quite similar. But yes, this is my, so honestly, we were schooled to the culture is um, in fact, even if you phone in sick, you were um, the person answering the call who was usually the night matron would inquire as to your symptoms and they had to be severe for you to come into, for you to miss work. Um, what we found, and I don't think that this was an integrity thing, honestly, I, we found that healthcare workers, and this is a rush, um, so they, they may have worked previous shifts. Um, they're rushing to come on duty because uh, they've got to be in their unit. They've already got to have changed into scrubs, et cetera. So they're already rushing and there's a whole lot more processes that have been put in place. And they're often on public transport, et cetera. 
they just want to get through the door. And for them, the screening had become almost like you're just, it's just a tick list. It's not even, it's not a checklist. It's just a tick list um, that you're, you're trying to work your way through. And you're like, yes, 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 yes. Or no, 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 no. I don't have any of those things. Um, and, and mostly nurses and doctors, they can explain their symptoms away. No, they've just got sinusitis. They, um, they're prone to hay fever. So the sore throat they've got um, is just sinusitis or it's just hay fever. And maybe you've got parents telling the kids, no, man, you, um, you often get sinusitis um, or hay fever this time of year. It's no problem. But what we did find... Um, I, I did not conduct a study, but anecdotally, I think more, more suspected and later confirmed cases of COVID amongst our staff were identified um, by concerned managers inquiring as to someone's genuine well being. So, having, and we had a, a staff of nine people having to do screening on a daily basis, um, the screeners. Someone didn't arrive at work after putting on their uniform, catching public transport. They didn't arrive at the door and, and then go, oh, yes, I've actually got a sore throat. Um, but only when, um, when a concerned manager looked at their skin color, their pallor, looked that they're quite quiet today, only then... Um, did they admit their symptoms and, and actually be willing to say, well, you know, okay, actually, yes, I, I do have a sore throat. Initially, it was just scratchy, but now I've actually got a sore throat. Um, uh, yeah. My sense is that screening by someone who knows you well is far more effective. So later, um, and I don't, it's not, it, this also has its unintended consequences. If you have screening at the front of the school, but then you're also expecting the teachers to be keeping an eye on the learners and to, um, to almost be doing an informal screening because they know the learners better. But yeah, that was something that was um, put on the unit managers, the person in charge of a unit. Um, and yeah, that, that was actually the most effective screening and healthcare workers, um, probably because it's been uh, it's been grilled into them, they feel guilty for not coming to work for something like a mere sore throat. And yet, a sore throat is you should be um, like you know that is a that is reason enough um, not to go to school or not to go to work. And <laughs> my next point, and I'll continue now on to temperature screening no one has a high temperature with these temperature devices I <laughs> for my sins I um I was in charge of um uh, of writing the position paper for a big private hospital group on um on thermometry so the science of taking temperatures and how thermometry, the science of taking temperatures, would be done in the different settings, in the ICU, in the high care, in theater, in the different types of wards. So I understand the science of thermometry, the, the different routes, the gold standard, and the difference between core temperature and peripheral temperature or surface temperature. And, um, and sadly, um, we've spent a uh, phenomenal amount of time and energy and money on um, measuring temperature with these infrared scanners. And they are, uh, for many reasons, and you can watch a movie on that, but they are ineffective. I, I'm yet, honestly, um, the hospital where I worked for a nine month period and where I was in charge of screening, um, I was aware of one person, and it must be out of 100,000 people, staff and visitors and patients coming in that actually had a temperature. And that is in keeping with the data from when they do screening at airports in Africa to control the spread of Ebola. Okay, um, 
so what does work in my opinion and in my experience um, to be compliant you're, you're conducting screening but I, I do question the true effectiveness of screening in its current form what does work is vigilance um, care and concern care and concern about your colleagues care and concern um, about um, about everyone that works um, on the grounds and um, in my case the patients as well um, in your case the learners empathy so uh, an understanding that the reason why the person came to school or the reason why the person came to work and then you you can't have a punitive culture you can't punish the person for um for not having told you that they were symptomatic etc so um i found over a period of time that that was far more beneficial than um than what we're currently doing because we're also um we're being compliant because those were department of labor um, requirements. Um, in, in putting together this presentation, um, I found a very, very nice um, article by um, two experts in human physiology, two professors in human physiology, Andrea Fuller and Duncan Mitchell from Wits University. And already in June 2020, when we after level five lockdown and we were and they were going, oh, please, um, <laughs> to detect fever requires measuring core body temperature. Now, in the ICU setting, we do that with a urine catheter. We have a special urine catheter with a temperature probe or we have a probe that actually goes into the heart. That's the most accurate, but that comes with complications. So we tend not to do that anymore. So our patients have urine catheters and that measures the temperature in the core, the actual temperature. Um, if, we, uh, if there's no indication to, to give a patient a urine catheter, the next um, most accurate route is the mouth um, under the tongue. And then all other routes, the next next accurate route is under the armpit, the axilla. Um, and, uh, and then the least accurate <laughs> is the ones where we take the temperature of the, um, it's called thermal artery or temporal artery thermometry. So this is what these devices, they actually temporal artery thermometers. I promise you, they are not hand, wrist and neck thermometers. <laughs> they are not calibrated for that. They are there. So what happened was um, uh, people weren't getting, they were getting low temperatures or if they hold. So the, there's just so many things that influence the accuracy of it. If you hold it, so it depends on the device. If you read the package insert, some have to be held um, five to eight centimeters away from the forehead, others three to five centimeters. We did a study where we asked, um, we asked actually um, analysts. So these are these are um, these are people that have a postgraduate degree in in analytics. We asked these people to judge three to five centimeters for us and we looked at the accuracy of that so, so it's not it's wholly inaccurate and if you hold it less than three centimeters if you hold it like one centimeter from the forehead um, you're going to get a much higher temperature if you hold it six centimeters away from the forehead you're going to get a much lower temperature and, uh, and then if you start going into, so that's me rolling, much like Judge Judy, that's me rolling my eyeballs. Um, uh, you can go into some of the, you, there's a video clip over there, and that's the actual article by Prof Fuller and Mitchell. Um, uh, but I know in our society and, and given our current, um, what is expected, we do this. What I'm cautioning against is, is the effectiveness of it and, um, and how much um, credence you put into it. So you go, oh, uh, our learners are all screened, everything's okay. 
um, just know that it it uh, there are many things that we'll be adding to to the inaccuracy and ineffectiveness of this. Another thing, if you go into the if you if you go into this particular um, clip. The temperature, the thermometer does not, these um, infrared thermometers do not function well at a temperature below 10 degrees Celsius. The reason why I also knew this was because we had a, um, a hospital in the Northern Cape that where they were busy with renovations in the middle of winter and this icy cold wind would blow through the, the passages of one of the wards and they would move the thermometer from one patient room to another in the corridor and and then it just wouldn't it was giving the most inaccurate temperatures um, so it does not function below 10 degrees celsius it does not function accurately and then if it is kept indoors let's say indoors um, the temperature was um, 22 degrees and you move it to a different environment it needs 20 minutes to to actually calibrate um, if you start taking a temperature, if it was in the school office and you start taking a temperature at seven o'clock in the morning, not only is the temperature, that morning temperature, a problem, breezes, <laughs> the sweatiness of the children's brows, yeah, so, so many things. So, so please don't rely too much on temperature for telling you anything. Um, I, I do wonder... Um, I know currently for to be compliant, but I was very um, glad to hear um, when I engaged with the topic on Twitter that uh, people are saying you don't in Europe, you no longer see temperature measure and temperature measure <laughs> temperature measurement happening as part of screening. Okay, so I'm, I am hoping that this too shall be a thing of the past in our country and and in in our settings. Honestly, for me, sometimes I, I've, I, I have screened and I've nursed hundreds of people that ended up having COVID. And, um, and yes, the key symptoms are you know, those symptoms that you screen for, but sometimes it also presents as you actually just feel tired today. You just don't feel well. Um, your color is off. You're, you're just feeling so sleepy. You're... Um, you've got a slight headache, you're just not feeling great, you're not hungry, etc. Um, so I, I, have, I have to wonder to myself, tongue in cheek, if this isn't a better screening checklist or a more accurate screening checklist. Um, and I think knowing the person, having a relationship, being empathetic, inquiring if you see someone is slightly off color, I, I think that is the most effective screening. And unfortunately, that is that would be something that um, the teachers would do best. Okay. Um, before I go on to masks, are there any, um, any questions about screening? Have I said something so controversial that everyone is, has gone and hidden away? Jessica, you have to be my, my balance here. Yeah, I, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but I see for the previous round, um, Anwil raised his hand. He had a question uh, on the pre previous round of questions. Anwil, you want to post a question now or did we answer your question? Good afternoon. It's not Anwar speaking. It's, it's Nigel Adams speaking. Okay. Afternoon, oh, Nigel. Know. Yes. Um, I was I was asking the question. We're sitting here as a group. Um, Anwar is also with us. Yes. So we're sitting here, and now we now doubting our practice at school because we heard the screening is now actually nullified by what he said by the presenter. So um, the other thing that we wanted to say earlier is that learners come to school sick from home and if they cough at school, we so tense, 
they just sneeze in class. Then we show teens, oh, you must go to the office. You, you, you're not feeling well. And that, that uh, apprehensiveness makes it very difficult to, to also um, manage COVID in the school because I can't now say you must stay in school, the learner must stay in school or the learner must go home or we must now find out where the learner was and, and who was the learning contact with. And that is all the questions that we must now ask. And, and parents send the, send the learners to school as, because the school is, is, the, is the caregiver for the day because the, the parent is in, at work now and we are staying as the parents of the school in the school. So now she, she knows that somebody was tested at home but she still sends a kid to the school because he's gonna get food at school, he's gonna be taken care of, he's gonna get this um, education even. So the risk is so much higher. And now um, uh, the presenter says that, that the screening thing that we, we put the, the gun, the screening gun against the face or on the risk or wherever, that is what we do. And, and that is how we went along with it and now it's pointed out as a very bad practice even. So it's now actually very, 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 it can only have a work in the world with the Makani. So that is what I'm saying. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anwar. I'm going to say, where are you going to go? We're going to go to Montague, and we're going to go. Okay. Bye, thank you. So I, um, I obviously, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is, is I, I, you, pr you probably can't change your, you're expected to screen. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the presentation, when I go into some of the other controls that, that are more effective, I'm hoping you'll actually feel a lot more comfortable. So your knowledge, um, you feel more empowered when it comes to understanding masks and ventilation and environmental cleaning and the role that those play. So please don't, yeah, please don't put all your, um, you know, like ah, they've been screened is, is what my key message is that, that the way screening, screening is flawed. Sc screening is not perfect especially with how it's um, currently done. Jessica's now covering her nose even and her mouth. <laughs> Jessica, you're alone in the room. You don't have to, it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, I am. Um, I obviously, you can't go to uh, your circuit manager and say from now on, we're not doing screening. So this is actually just, it's, to, it's, it's a discussion to challenge some of the some of the thinking, some of the practices um, with the science, um, yeah. And please don't get too um, too freaked out until until the the full presentation <laughs> has been concluded. Yeah, I just wish we could stop scanning. Um, I saw that it's a waste. I wish we could stop scanning. Yes, it's not. We're doing is just a waste of time. Yeah. I mean, I, I know, yeah, we can just sanitize the learners, keep social distance and teach. So that, that's just it. Coming back to my, my slide, remember with the yellow blocks, we're doing so much. Now, sometimes when a, when a crisis hits us, we put so many things in place and we're not actually sure which of those changes were actually an improvement or which of those changes have prevented the spread of COVID, for example. The, the science tells us that temperature screening is not one of those things, or even current screening where the person doesn't know the person very well that they're screening, they don't have a relationship. The science evidence does not support that screening is, is effective. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> I think we, we're, we're at the point where we, we, we should be questioning. So what changes do we keep what what things do we keep in place and what stuff can we remove because the unintended consequence of all the focus on COVID is like where's the focus on teaching and learning um, and so much effort going into COVID prevention and perhaps unnecessary anxiety around certain things and you know the 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 emphasis has shifted, unfortunately. So these are these are it's it's a conversation, 
and and hopefully it starts some more interesting conversations okay i'm assuming there aren't any other questions jessica do you see anything or can i continue continue yolanda you okay. can continue i just want to give you a heads up um yes uh, we we got we, we must allow a couple of minutes also for maybe a last couple of questions and comments so yeah please and that would be at six, um before 16:30 hey the session yes. finishes at 16:30 yeah. Okay. yeah thank you so much jessica thank you for that okay so um some things i've seen around masks and um i also i um i had to i, I was responsible for drafting the position paper on cloth masks and input into all the infection control practices at hospital level to prevent the spread of COVID. So um, this is a very, very, very nice um, summary article on um, the different masks and their uh, pros and cons. A very, very quick summary <clears throat> is that a cloth mask is fantastic as long as it's a double layer firmly woven material cloth masks. So you get, um, you get these cloth masks, you get these masks, as long as it's a double layer, you get these other ones, from example, from Take-A-Lot, which is just a single layer of fabric. It needs to be a two, at least two layers of fabric for it to be okay. Um, the, what I see a lot of people wearing are, um, are cloth masks or um, you know, masks that you purchase that have got these vents, so vented masks, and actually they're not indicated. So with COVID being, um, yes, it's easier for, um, for you to breathe, um, but if you happen to have COVID, you are going to blow all of those aerosols into the environment. Something we didn't know in the beginning, I'll show you, I've even got a picture of myself wearing um, an N95 mask with these vents. Um, the current infection control guidelines and the recommendations are do not wear these because you don't know if, if you might have COVID and you're actually blowing it into the environment. And now that um, COVID, um, um, shown to be airborne, shown to be spread through aerosols, you don't want to be doing that. Okay, so that mask, not, not, uh, not a good idea. Obviously, your kind of surgical mask, um, triple layer of tissue paper is great, except if it gets wet, if there's any wetness, it has to be changed. In fact, for all of these, um, as soon as it's wet, and for for kids, for example, that are drooling or um, uh, they would need the mask to be changed four or five times a day. And yes, um, if you want to wear a respirator, so these N95 masks are actually termed respirators, but they are actually um, very uncomfortable to wear for long periods of time. They, they cause fatigue. And they're, they're no more effective than the blue surgical mask unless um, they are completely occlusive. So we do a seal test and a fit test um, to make sure that the only air you're breathing in is, is filtered through the, the woven material. It doesn't come in through the gaps in your mask. So what is recommended <clears throat> in in the school setting is a good quality cloth mask double layer um, or a, um, these surgical face masks you can wear if you've got very high comorbidity uh, very high risk high comorbidities just know that this is only um, more effective than this if you've got a complete seal okay um, all right the face shields i know i've read the guidelines um, uh, kids on the autism spectrum disorder, kids, kids that um, uh, may may be deaf, etc. Um, you, they um, can wear face shields, but no one else should be wearing a face shield. So if I go back to mask, the purpose of the mask. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, 
as I'm, if I, as I'm speaking right now, and I can actually see it on my keyboard, I am um, actually spitting droplets. So without me even sneezing or coughing, just my talking, I'm producing fine droplets that are landing on my keyboard, probably on my screen. And I'm breathing out aerosols. Um, and if I was sharing the room with Jessica, she'd be putting her scarf around her face right now. So um, I'm in the room alone, don't worry. <laughs> so I'm, I'm droplets and aerosols are being generated. Any one of these masks, except for the one with the vents, is going to filter and stop. It will stop the droplets and it will filter my aerosols. Then obviously um, the, the manufactured ones would be better for the air that I breathe in to filter the air in terms of the aerosols that are in the air. So if I breathe in those aerosols, it would filter it and it would do a far better job. If I, like in the ICU setting where I wear the respirator or N95 and I've done my own um, sealed check and it's completely sealed, my only breathing is through the actual um, material, then I'm filtering any aerosols and there's excellent filtration. Okay, so that is, it's, it's a two-way two -way purpose. Um, and these face shields, um, unless they are contraindicated, for example, kids with autism spectrum disorder, kids who, um, who are deaf and, and need to lip read, they do not stop. Um, they don't stop any droplets. In fact, you would, um, and then they would drop and you'd be, it would be, you know, it, this is actually a surface now, which is contaminated when you're taking it off and on. It's actually, I don't know if you've seen, and also the, from breathing, the condensation that you get on it, it's really quite gross. Um, and uh, it's not filtering anything from the, from the environment. Okay, so there's no filtration happening. So all you're doing is blocking and, and, um, and I, I want you to understand that when we wear this in the hospital setting, the reason why healthcare workers wear this is because the mask is not waterproof. So this, um, uh, that blue surgical mask and this N95 respirator, only the very, very expensive ones, which are very difficult to procure, et cetera, are waterproof. So when we're dealing with a patient who's actually coughing and, um, and sneezing and and struggling with their breathing. So they're also blowing droplets. Um, your mask can easily become contaminated because of the very close contact. I'm helping someone to adjust their oxygen, etc. So that face shield is to create a waterproof barrier to keep my mask safe for longer. That's the only reason we wear face shields and to protect our eyes also because of the incredibly close contact. I don't get to, as an ICU sister, I don't get to keep a meter's distance from a patient who's struggling to breathe. I'm right in their face, readjusting their position, et cetera. So it's also to prevent um, splatter, droplet splatter in my eyes and on my mask, okay? So I hope, and so I also, the Judge Judy look, <laughs> I'm like, oh, when I see people wearing face shields, when there isn't a true indication, I, I do want to lose my mind a little bit. Um, and, and I've already explained to you, this is me uh, going into the ICU. And right in the beginning, we didn't realize that we should not be wearing these. These are for... Um, settings where um, you're working in like a um, high dust environment, et cetera, and you want, and you're, you're, it's not in the middle of a pandemic and you want to be able to breathe out comfortably, <laughs> breathe in and breathe out through a valve comfortably. But if I had COVID and we actually um, found that this was a contributing factor in, um, in some of our cluster outbreaks between staff, and in certain settings, that if the person had COVID, they're mer merrily breathing out aerosols, COVID aerosols into the setting because of these vented masks. Um, I cannot emphasize enough 
the importance of ventilation. And in it, it is in the guidelines, but it is not emphasized. And I don't hear anyone speaking about it. And when I look at classrooms, I don't see windows open. I see doors open, but what you critically need is cross ventilation. I'm just double checking the time. You require cross ventilation. You require um, a flow of air and a movement of air. So in a classroom, all windows should be open. In a church, I attended a memorial service yesterday. Windows need to be open. It can't just be the door. Aerosols are being produced. So even, um, uh, even if, if everyone wore those surgical masks, um, they're still produced. Some aerosols are still um, leaking from the sides of those masks, which, which is acceptable. But... Uh, if it is those aerosols are building up in a closed environment or um, a, an environment with just the door open is almost no better than um, an environment where there is a flow of air. You actually need to be able to feel the movement of air to dilute the aerosols that are being breathed out. Okay, so, so that's, um, that's absolutely critical. In our cluster outbreaks in units, they occurred in small tea rooms. And yes, there was um, perfect physical distancing between, between staff members. Um, but the windows, the window and the door were not open. They, it was not being diluted. Um, and it built up in there to a, a critical concentration. So um, I can't emphasize this enough. I heard um, the same thing, obviously, is an issue when, um, for example, teachers and, are, or pupils are sharing transport. So there's a lift club. Now suddenly, yes, you had physical distancing, physical spacing in the car. There were maybe four teachers in one car. Everyone was wearing their mask, but um, they're now all close contacts um, or all four end up um, having confirmed COVID. Um, you can't just have a mask on. You have to have good ventilation. You have to have the windows open. It's something that's not emphasized um, when it comes to taxis, etc. But it's probably the most critical thing. Okay, so um, I I hope that I've answered and maybe cleared up some of the um, discrepancies around different masks. Um, as a, if I was a teacher, I would be wearing the more effective um, blue surgical mask. You also want to be able to speak. It's more comfortable than the cloth mask. Um, you can speak and breathe more easily. Just know that you've probably you've got to replace that mask more regularly. Okay. Um, the N95 is no more effective unless you're doing that. And then trust me, you actually struggle to breathe. And if you're having to talk a lot, there's no ways you can do that with an N95 respirator. Then just rather use the, the blue surgical mask. Okay, but please, um, windows and doors open for cross ventilation. And my final thing, I unfortunately didn't set it up as presenter view, but you also, you need to be role modeling how masks are worn. Um, the mask that is just worn over the mouth is, is catching your droplets, but it's not catching your aerosols and it is not filtering anyone else's aerosols. So the person who thinks that they're very clever wearing the mask under their nose is not protecting themselves and is doing a very poor, uh, very poor effort at protecting those around them. Okay, so it's also about role modeling the the correct wearing of it. You wear it correctly. You um, you keep areas well ventilated, etc. Okay, um, I saw there's just a request for feedback. Um, let me go on to the next slide. I think I'm finished preaching about that. Um, the third last thing that I wanted to just very briefly touch on, um, when we got our first positive cases um, or suspected cases in the hospital, we, it was like a groot gedunte, and all our time and effort went into dealing with these suspected or confirmed cases. Um, Jessica um, 
invites and, and often um, principles are confirmed um, to come to really important meetings and workshops um, for leadership development, et cetera. And then um, they cancel last minute because they are dealing with suspected or confirmed cases, they. Um, so I went to the guidelines and to actually see, so who is supposed to be doing this? And there's a section um, in the guidelines which talk about the, and I think I've got the, I didn't take the little picture there, um, but the roles and responsibilities of the SMT, the SGBS and the staff. And uh, 6.2.3 says establish a COVID response team led by the principal to, co to coordinate all COVID related activities, including internal and external com um, communication. So even though it is led by the school principal, my sense is that everything is being done by the school principal and not delegated to a team. And uh, yeah, I think it's important to, because we had the exact same, we fell into the exact same trap. All our effort and energy went into, it was like yeah. managing this one case of, of, of COVID and um, the, the close contact. And so much went into that and everything else starts falling flat. So I, I think, go, this has to be something that a team does. There, there are um, clear, clear sections delegated. Okay, my bit on cleaning, and um, hopefully this will clarify some uh, <laughs> some fogging things. Um, this is one just some of the sweetest cards that we received, thanking thanking um, the people working in the hospital. So thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, nurse. Thank you, food people and drink people. It's so cute. And thank you, cleaners. And I, um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you to the people that are keeping the classroom clean. And I don't know what your kind of cleaning ratios are and who's doing the cleaning. It sounds like it might be the technical people doing the cleaning. Um, obviously, I don't know enough about your context and your individual contexts. But the science of COVID. Now, COVID is like... I wanted to use a, a word and then I don't want to be put in the naughty corner, but it's such an easy virus. I wanted to call it a, I won't just, just trust me, of all the viruses, of all the organisms that we need to be killing with cleaning, COVID is like the easiest to clean, okay? It is the most susceptible to, to, to any microbi microbiocides and You'll see here, so it's an enveloped virus, all the human coronaviruses, your colds, SARS-CoV-2, your different influenzas, uh, even HIV and, uh, no, where is it? Yes, HIV and your various hepatitis, they are, they, you kill them with just soap, literally like soap dishwashing liquid, normal detergent that um, you clean your kitchen counter with, that kills um, COVID. It kills SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> okay? Um, it's enough to break that capsule down. Um, I think what got lost in translation is what we do in the hospital setting. So, I went into, and this was actually what I meant to show you. So the standard operating procedure, the version, the latest version that I could find was the September 2020, and I apologize if it has changed since then. Um, but I went into the different cleaning definitions. So cleaning is the physical or mechanical removal of foreign material, um, mostly dust. Um, so on your surfaces, it would be dust. And... Um, and organic material, often like oiliness, our hands are oily. Um, so there's an oily, there's often an oily glean, an, oily, an oiliness to uh, two surfaces. You cannot disinfect something before cleaning it. Um, soap and water and, and rubbing, so with mechanical effort to break down those, um, those little capsules, that is required. Um, 
that is cleaning. And disinfection does not work without cleaning. So in the hospital setting, before there's any disinfection, there's cleaning. And um, generally, the cleaning will, rem will remove microorganisms rather than kill them, except when it comes to the coronaviruses, um, if we go back to the previous slide, they are very susceptible just to detergents, just to soap and water. Um, uh, this is um, routine cleaning, so what would be required um, from you on a daily basis, and that would be literally, it would be removing the oily residue from hands and potentially contaminated hands on desks and door handles and all of that. Now, deep cleaning is, um, and this comes straight from here, deep cleaning is, is, is what we do in the hospital setting. So um, you'll see in bold, it says it does not apply to an office area or a gym or school or other workspace uh, where deep cleaning is not indicated. So deep cleaning is only in a healthcare setting where we've had, a, we've had an infectious patient, they have coughed onto without masks and breathed and touched in an environment for an extended period of time. And it's on um, monitors and it's on blood pressure cups and it's on the drip machines, et cetera. That requires um, something called terminal or deep cleaning. So not indicated in your setting according to the SOP for the containment and management of COVID in, in schools and school communities. Um, so what is fascinating, this quick guide to the SOP, which um, was recently made available, it's like a five pager. Um, this is the picture. And this is actually, um, I'm gonna go, this is what in, in, um, in the healthcare setting, fogging is where you bring in a machine that literally emits aerosols, uh, usually chlorine based, um, that in areas where uh, hard to reach areas, crevices, etc., that you didn't get to with, um, with basically elbow grease. Um, if you didn't get to it with that, then it gets into those nooks and crannies. Okay, but it is can be hazardous for health. And, and this is what fogging is. And fogging is not indicated. I'll show you on the next on the next slide. So what I what I think where some of the lost in translation, um, when you talk about nozipo, when you talk about people come in and they spray everything, the spraying with alcohol, alcohol is disinfectant. Firstly, um, just the routine cleaning with soap and water on high touch surfaces is honestly sufficient. Spraying everything may actually just, um, if, if, if that surface has not been physically cleaned with soap and water beforehand, um, all it might be doing is actually damaging equipment, damaging surfaces, um, reducing, increasing the wear and tear over the long run. Okay. Um, so I urge you to go back to the, the previous manual, the, the manual that you followed, the standard operating procedure, and go and look at what is prescribed. Fogging is not prescribed. Whoever, um, whoever came up with this used the incorrect um, use the incorrect diagram here. Yeah, it's, it's not indicated. If you read the text very clearly, it's about cleaning. They talk about disinfected daily, but you can't disinfect without cleaning. So yes, I guess on high touch surfaces, you could use 70% alcohol or you could use um, like a jig based chlorine. But as you, if you go back and look at the science, this just detergent is good enough to kill COVID. Okay, and uh, this is also from the standard operating procedure. Um, so, so my the the definition of fogging is fumigation or misting, and it's dispersing a liquid chemical disinfectant to disinfect environmental surfaces in an enclosed space. You do not want that going out into the general environment. 
Um, it's sometimes indicated in a healthcare facility after an infectious patient with a highly resistant pathogen like Clostridium difficile. So you'll see, we, we're, they don't even <laughs> recommend it for coronaviruses. They don't recommend it for SARS-CoV-2 because they don't see the point. It, there's no evidence that we, even in the hospital setting, we should be fogging. But there are many healthcare providers that insist on fogging. But um, in the hospital setting now, when we convert a COVID ICU um, after a wave back to a normal ICU, uh, after all, after it has been environmentally cleaned for a day from, from, from this floor, from the roof to the ceiling, um, then we just generally fog it just for safety sake, but it's actually not even evidence-based. And you certainly shouldn't be fogging, this kind of fogging, fumigation and misting. And the just spraying, surface spray, without wiping or without cleaning beforehand also makes absolutely no sense and is not evidence-based, okay? And my very last slide before, um, before there's 10 minutes for questions is that um, I'm sure you all know Mia Milan um, uh, from Becky Sisa and she, uh, I saw an interesting tweet from her yesterday, today's the 21st, hey, yesterday, the FDA, um, an, a Pfizer study has actually just found that, um, that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is safe and highly effective in children five to 11 years old. So already in other countries, they're starting to give um, uh, older children the vaccination. Um, the um, Pfizer is going to be submitting their application to the FDA for approval by the end of the month. So it is on the horizon. And I do think that we need to be readying learners for vaccination. Okay, so this is me. You can find me on Twitter at Yolanda Walsh. You can email me. Um, as Jessica said, I have my own company called Sagewood, which is an improvement consultancy. So um, it's Yolanda at sagewood.me, sagewood.me. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing um, and take some questions. Uh, what I wanted to say, I mean, honestly, we can have all of these environmental controls and administrative controls like screening. Um, and when we have a positive case, we can, um, we can manage, uh, manage it so that it doesn't become a cluster outbreak, et cetera, or that it doesn't spread. But the thing that is going to get us out of this Ooh. is vaccination. And it's vaccination of all teachers. It's encouraging um, your community that the school is based in to be vaccinated, running education sessions, discussing fears, understanding what the hesitancy is, um, because that is what is going to, that is how we, how this is going to end. Um, and until we get much higher rates of vaccination, we're just going to fourth wave, fifth wave, et cetera. Been there, done that. So thank you very much. Thank you for um, listening to my controversial unpacking of the evidence <laughs> uh, on some of the practices that, that I hear and see in the school setting. Thank you.